Hi, you're listening to Watchmen on the Pod. This is Pamela, and with me is Nikki. Hello. We are going to begin Chapter 3 in the book reading of Inside Out by Larry Crabb. And let's dig a little bit deeper on the inside of us to see. Starts off with knowing what to look for. Exploring the heart is both important and tricky business. When nervous feelings twist our stomach into knots, we want to know why. What is happening in our deceitful heart and foolish mind to create these awful feelings? An inside look is necessary but confusing. And within Christian circles, there is little help, little to help us in a carefully searching through our insides to see what is wrong. For centuries, the church has assumed responsibility for the care and cure of souls, believing that only God can adequately deal with the the corruption and loneliness of the human heart. But when Freud introduced the era of depth psychology, church men began to wonder if their simple prescriptions of confession, forgiveness, and reconciliation were strong enough medicine to treat the newly identified complexities beneath the surface of people's lives. Such things as repressed emotions, fragmented egos, psychosexual fixations seem too much for the well-meaning but psychologically naive pastor. In the mid-1900s, a movement took shape that has profoundly influenced our modern understanding of how to help people change. The church, uniquely equipped to respond to spiritual matters, such things as one's relationship to God and eternal destiny, turned to psychology for help in dealing with the mundane, but often more urgent questions about getting along with oneself and others in this life. Behind this merger is the definite assumption that a deep understanding of ourselves is better achieved through the insight of psychology than through the wisdom of scripture <clears throat> efforts to figure out what's going on inside that depend on biblical ideas are regarded as a bit shallow incisive perhaps in identifying spiritual problems such as rebellion or unbelief but weak in explaining the many personal problems we all face to really understand your daughter's anorexia or your own lack of confidence, you must go outside the church, or at least to a pastor with psychological training. The difficulty with this bias is that it's largely justified. Churches often have a woefully simplistic understanding of the problems people experience. A fair number seem to glory in their ignorance by insisting that there is no need for an inside look, just morbid introspection, some say about any attempt at self-understanding. If people would get into the Word on their knees and out into their neighborhoods witnessing for Christ, they would have no time for personal aches and pains. Forget all the psychological business of looking inside and get serious about your commitment to Christ. The choice comforting, I'm sorry, the choice confronting many sincere, struggling Christians is either one, To ignore the critical issue of eternal character development and just try harder to be a good Christian without ever understanding what's happening beneath the surface of their lives. Or, two, to take an inside (coughs) look guided more by current psychological theory than by biblical revelation. Identifying your temperament, healing painful memories, learning to ventilate buried hurts, reconstructing the damaging impact of your parents' mistakes, and facing destructive emotions and hidden agendas and bringing them under conscious control are all examples of the second alternative. Neither of the two options move us toward the kind of deep character change our Lord desires. If we are to change from the inside out, we must understand what eternal problems need correction. That requires an inside look, and the inside look must be guided by the Bible's teaching on what to expect when we peel off the layers and explore what lurks beneath the surface. I submit that we're long overdue for an understanding of how to change that begins with an honest look 
at what we're like beneath the surface and as guided by the script, the light of the scripture. The Bible is trust, trustworthy in all that it says, but is it sufficient to say all that we need to change from the inside out? We will find it sufficient if we read the Bible as 66 love letters by our Father to tell us everything we need to know to become the people He created us to be. An inside look is important, but as already stated, it is tricky. The Bible, the same Bible that instructs us to guard our heart, see Proverbs 4.23, also tells us our heart is impossible to understand as well as deceitfully wicked. See Jeremiah 17, 9. The command to keep watch over our unknowable heart seems rather like ordering a guard to never let an invisible prisoner out of his sight. Clearly, if our insides are as different to know as the Bible indicates, then our only hope of an accurate inward look depends entirely on God's willingness to help. Students of the human personality can uncover mounds of data and organize their findings into intriguing and perhaps insightful theories. But, without God's help, no effort to explore the heart will ever pinpoint the core problems that need changing. The good news, of course, is that the opposite is also true. With God's help, we can understand what needs to be understood. When depression slowly erodes our energy, when strong urges to do wrong pops out of nowhere, when honest feedbacks make, feedback makes it clear that we're not good at communicating love, we can and must conf remain confident that the Bible will guide <coughs> us in our inside look to whatever issues need our attention. Deep Longings and Wrong Strategies in the rest of this chapter, I want to get us started on our inward look. A helpful place to begin is with a record of what God saw when he looked deeply into the hearts of his people during a time in their history when they were slipping far away from him. Listen to his comments to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Notice two observations the text suggests. First, people are thirsty. Although the fact of universal thirst is not directly stated, it is clearly assumed. Subsequent references to thirsty hearts in the Bible, as well as to the fact that people were designed to enjoy satisfaction available only in God support the idea that every person is thirsty. We all long for what God designed us to enjoy. Tension-free relationships filled with deep, loving acceptance and opportunities to make a difference to someone else. Observe carefully that in our text, God assumes his people are thirsty, but never condemns them for that thirst. Thirst is not the problem. Neither of the two sins he rebukes them for involves the fact that people are thirsty. Second, people are moving in wrong directions in response to their thirst. They refuse to trust God to look after their thirst. Instead, they insist on maintaining control of finding their own satisfaction. They're all moving about determined to satisfy the longings of their hearts by picking up a shovel looking for a likely spot to dig, and then searching for fulfillment they can generate. To put it simply, people want to run their own lives. Fallen man is both terrified of vulnerability and committed to maintaining independence. The human race got off on a very, on a seriously wrong foot when Eve yielded to Satan's lie that more satisfaction was available if she took matters into her own hands. When Adam joined her in looking for life outside of God's revealed will, he infected all his descendants with the disease of self-management. Now, no one seeks after God in an effort to find life. 
the most natural thing for us to do is develop strategies for finding life that reflect our commitment to depending on our own resources. Simple trust is out of fashion. Self-protection has become the norm. The scriptures consistently expose people as both thirsty and foolish. We long for the satisfaction we were built to enjoy, but we all move away from God to find it. An inside look, then, can be expected to uncover two elements embedded deeply in our heart. Number one, thirst or deep longings for what we do not have. And two, stubborn independence reflected in wrong strategies for finding the life we desire. It is with an understanding of these two fundamental elements that we can productively explore beneath the surface of our everyday problems. The first element, deep longings, reflects our humanness and the dignity accorded to us as bearers of God's image. We long for a quality of relationship and meaning that no other creature has the capacity to enjoy. We were designed to richly enjoy the person of God as well as his provisions. The second element, wrong strategy, <clears throat> exists because we are sinful. Only foolish, rebellious, proud people would move away from the source of life in search of a fulfillment they can control. And that is exactly what we've done and do. Spouses demand certain responses from one another as a condition for life. People require that they never hurt again the way they did they once did in some previous trauma. We divide devise strategies designed to keep us warmly involved with each other at a safe distance. We live to gain life from others and to protect ourselves from whatever we think is life threatening. An inside look must anticipate uncovering deep unsatisfied longings that bear testimony to our dignity as well as foolish and ineffective strategies for keeping ourselves out of pain that reflect our depravity each of us is a glorious ruin and the further we look into our heart the more clearly we can see the wonder of our ability to enjoy relationship alongside the, str the tragedy of our determination to arrange for our own protection from hurt. Look into yourself through a pair of glasses with one lens that sees your dignity as a bearer of God's image and with the other lens that sees your depravity as a person whose desire to rest in God's goodness has been corrupted into a passion to look out for yourself. Taking an inside look. One brief illustration may clarify how these two elements operate beneath the surface. A married couple wonders what to do with their 22-year-old son who has dropped out of college with a drinking problem and wants to return home. The usual Christian approach to resolving their question would be consult a few experts to see whether there's a consensus and how biblical principles might apply. After consulting with their advisors and praying, that God would overrule any wrong decision they might make. They decide either to forbid their son to return home, to teach him responsibility, or to welcome him back to dis demonstrate grace. But suppose we were to take an inside look, for bef inside look before arriving at the decision. Perhaps the, perhaps the young man's longing for respect and involvement have gone unmet in a family where dad is distant hostile and uninvolved and where mom clings protectively to her son for the intimacy her husband denies her in that situation perhaps the, perhaps the son should be received home with both an apology from dad for his cold distant and commitment to learn how to warmly relate and a commitment from mom to healthily back away from her son as she learns to more as she learns to more openly share her pain with her husband. In order to make these changes, both parents would need to look inside themselves to see their own unsatisfied thirst and their self-protective styles of relating. For example, 
Dad might need to face how deeply inadequate he feels to give of himself with any hope of finding respect. Perhaps his father never valued him for anything other than his work habits. As a result, he may have learned to work hard and give a little of himself, hoping this style of relating would bring him everything he wanted. When his son began giving him trouble during his teen years, Dad likely withdrew into working harder, feeling angry at his son for letting him down, but being unwilling to share openly his concern and affection for fear that what he shared of himself would not be well received by his son. His longings for respect and for relationship with his son are legitimate. His strategy of keeping his distance to protect himself from rejection is sinful. Perhaps mom, <clears throat> after years of living with a man who never gave himself to her, had become a hard woman, a mother who, matter of factly, performed her marital duties, her feminine soul, maternal, maternal duties, sorry, her feminine soul may have been aching with the pain of loneliness and neglect, a pain so terrible that her only solution, in her mind, was to never again be close enough to anyone to be hurt. The deep love she felt for her son may have been hidden behind the barricade of self-protective coolness. To make it even more complex, perhaps mom, although dutiful in her approach to mothering, yielded to her unquenchable desires for intimacy by becoming manipulatively involved with her son. The boy may have felt unwanted by his father and controlled by his mother. Without for a moment excusing his sinful behavior by focusing on his parents' failures, I would still want to see the family face their relational problems if the young man were to return home. If, on the other hand, the family has characterized by a soft-touch father who granted his son's every wish and a docile mother who could never say no to anything, then it might be wise to require certain evidence of responsibility in their son before offering to welcome him home. No amount of looking inside will yield perfect certainty about what to do, but some understanding of what is going on within us will help us see what changes must occur on the inside before effective external change can be expected. In part two, I want to explore the deep longings of the human heart, and in part three, how we come up with the wrong strategies to deal with them. Part 4 suggests the biblical means for shifting direction from protecting ourselves to pursuing God. And that shift, as we will see later, is the core of change from the inside out. So that's the end of part 1. Part 1, yeah. Chapters 1, 2, and 3. Yeah. Next is? Oh, part 2. We're thirsty people. Amen. Yeah. But you know the the um what is that? What would you call that right there with the quotations? That little sentence. Is it like the catchphrase? Yeah, for the for the for three part chapters. two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It it says I don't want to admit it, but I know there's something wrong. Something's wrong. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's where I know that's where I'm at. I can tell. There is something wrong. And, you know, oddly enough, there was bits and stuff, you know, because granted, we had started reading this and um, then we realized we needed to record it. And so rereading this, yeah. I picked up much more on a few areas. And it's like, I struggle with that. I didn't realize I struggle with that, but I really struggle with that. Yeah. That self-protective, um, not trying to strategize and be like okay I got plan A, B, C and D just in case Yeah. instead of I fully Lord this is yours you know I'm not even going to worry about it you just tell me what you you know lead and guide me yeah yeah you exactly know? it's like instead of it kind of reminds me of like bowling you know we put up the bumpers because yeah. if we put up the bumpers, we're guaranteed to keep going, you know, straight. And not, you know, 
but we put up the bumpers. It's not saying that we don't, you know, ask the Lord to, you know, put his bumpers up where it's going to lead and guide us. Right, exactly. We are doing it. We're the ones that are pulling them up and being like, okay, now I got those up. It doesn't matter if I do this, this, or this. It's still going to hit a pin versus, you know, if we let his. Right. They may not even touch the sides. I mean, he can very much guide it right down the center. True. Yeah, lots to think about, actually, you know. The study guide, when I was um, transferring it over, I tell you, it's... Pretty intense, huh? Yeah. 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 It very much is. Um, to the fact of, honestly, um, I wouldn't be surprised if... If, if you're able to get the study guide and you're able to have it with you as we're reading, and if you're stop able to stop it, yeah. answer those questions honestly, you know, it, this isn't one of those, um, if you're really, really intending to put some of these things in, you know, really honestly taking that inside look um, to being able to change inside out, then you're going to want to go and have it with you and pause and, yeah. and and work on it and stuff. Yeah, this isn't one that's just a quick read, get it done and oh, over no. with, and no. you know, you go on to the next book. Actually, it's, it's just not. And really, when you think about it, I mean, here we are. We've, I mean, we've had days in between chapters and stuff, but that is not a horrible thing when you think about oh, it. Oh, no. no. Because no, those that are listening and doing the study guide all at the same time, it may take days because... It's pretty deep. Some of those questions will just kind of, I'll be honest, you know, it's like, really? It's kind of intrusive. I don't need to answer that. I'm not looking at that. And then it's like, you know, it kind of, I can't help it. It does. It kind of like eats at you a little bit. And then you're like, yeah. okay, well, I guess. Well, yeah, maybe I could look at it like that. Okay, yes, yes, that's exactly what it is. Okay, it's out there. You know, and, and that's and that's what it, the study guide reminds me of. But see, that's what God wants. This. God wants us to be absolutely open and honest with him. If we're not, how can he heal us, Nikki? Oh, I know it. How can I, he heal us? It, He's not interested in, you know, shoving it away in a dark corner because I tell you at the end of the day, he's going to say to you, depart from me because... I gave you the opportunity to get these things out, but you chose not to look in the mirror and to see them. Yeah. We can't bypass it. Well, and the fact of the matter, too, you know, as we go through that purifying and sanctification mm -hmm. and refining, and, you know, it it's like that. It always goes back to that one meme and that little story thing about the, um, the impurities and the, the molten... What was it? Which it was one? The dross for the silver? It was a uh, blacksmith. Mm hmm Is that what it well, is? Well, there's, there's many of them. There's, oops, there's one that is a refiner's fire, which is, you know, this the silversmith, where he'll go, remember, and he begins to purify the silver, and what he does is the dross will rise up, yep. skims that off, and then he does it again until he's yes. got nothing but pure silver. Yes, and that's exactly what this mm -hmm. reminds me of. Yeah. Because if we don't let go... Of these things and allow it to bubble up as that layer of dross at mm -hmm. the top then it won't be scooped away and if it's not scooped away right right then we're left with some deep-rooted things it also kind of reminds me of um, really quick when we were uh, weeding um, and we did and we ended up getting all those little revelations you were doing that one side I was doing I mean it's been a while but the fact of the matter there's some that roots were surface Mm -hmm. And you could just pull them up just by pulling them up. Right. There was others where you had to dig just a little bit and you mm -hmm. had to dig it wide to get, you know, to get it all. But then there was some that you flat out had to dig deep. Yeah, yeah. yeah and you yeah. had to dig deep. And the thing is, if you don't get the root out, when it begins to grow back, that root's going to be even stronger next time. Exactly. And that's what this also kind of reminds me of. I mean, there's yeah. so many implications and so many types and shadows that, you know, just this first portion just realizing that there's these different types of things and then realizing that there's these different categories in which you can find yourself but ultimately knowing that you know really there's 
you fall into this. Yeah. And realizing uh, well, the self-protection versus God's protection. Exactly. But, you know, the thing is, the bottom line is we cannot forget why he wrote this book. And he didn't write it in order for us to be better Christians. He wrote it in order for us to grow in our relationship yes. with the Father. See, it's all about relationship. And see, when you go back to, you know, like when I had said, you know, if we just skim over the surface and keep the things buried, you know, he's going to say, you know, depart from me. I know you're not. Because we did not go deeper into the relationship that he desires for us to have. And the thing is, once we see these things, Nikki, once we address these things, obviously with his help, the joy of the Lord will fill us full. And it says in the word of God, the joy of the Lord is our strength. This is what's going to help us be able to stand in the wicked day that we're living in. And then when we have done all to stand, what are we supposed to do? Stand still, right? I believe this is so very important for those that are, those that are desiring for more of the Lord, those that are thirsting for the Lord with such a thirst, because it says, as the deer panteth after the water brook, so does my soul pant after thee. You gotta want him. With us, speaking of relationships and stuff, you know, Jesus is our bridegroom mm -hmm. and we are the bride, the body. Um, you don't get married without having a relationship. No, you sure don't. And so, I mean, just the type and shadow of that and realizing that, you know, of course, I'm not putting like I, I know that I know because I've never been married. But, you know, I, I would reckon that you formulate that good relationship, that good bond, that good getting to know one another courtship yeah, yeah before you would just your likes, jump into dislikes, it you know right favorite color whatever you know you get to know that person and that person gets to know you now you're not going to jump into a lifelong relationship with lies covering up things if you are i guarantee it's not going to work out right it's not going to work out it's like building your foundation on sand exactly, exactly. do you think okay side note childlike mm -hmm. question here you know, I know it's going to sound stupid, but you, you had mentioned favorite color. Uh -huh. Do we know what Jesus' favorite color was? Do you I'm think assuming he had white. <laughs> oh, I never thought about I'm that. I'm assuming white. That's a good assumption. You know? Well, no, I'm serious. Like, yeah, you know, I you, mean, you just yeah. kind of wonder. I mean, I don't know. I can't say that's his favorite color, but I'm assuming it's white. But you know what I mean? Like, just the little because things like that. Because white represents purity. Who, who called it white? He did. You know what I mean? He's the one that, you know, he's the one that named all the stars. He's the one that named the colors. You understand what I'm saying? Don't you wonder sometimes, well, like... maybe Adam did. I'm not sure. Somebody do, did, do, Don't you wonder sometimes, like, you know, what his favorite food was? Was it fish and bread? <laughs> I don't you know. You know, I just, I you know, know, seriously, I just, I wonder sometimes, know. you know, just the little things. Right. I have no idea. Hmm. Well, I, I'm glad that we did this, um... I look forward to the second part. Yes. As it dives four. a little bit more deep. All right. Oh, my goodness. Excuse me. We love you all very, very much. Make sure you go through it and keep your eyes on Jesus. Always, always, always keep your eyes on Jesus. And when you have that study guide open, also have your Bible open next to it. Love you all. Good night. Good night.